Good evening. Tonight's discussion concludes a two-part presentation on the health effects of mercury, biochemistry, toxicology, and treatment. My name is James Roberts. I'm board certified in internal medicine and cardiology. I've been practicing invasive cardiology in Northwest Ohio for the past 19 years, and I'm medical director of comprehensive heart care, the ECP Center of Northwest Ohio, and the Advanced Magnetic Research Institute of Northwest Ohio, but you already know that. We review, we'll review, review a little bit from last week. We introduced mercury as a neurotoxin. Mercury poisons enzyme systems. As an example, we showed how mercury poisons the enzymes that uses energy to put tubulin together to make microtubules. You can't make microtubules. You can't make neuron axons. The nervous system does not work well. And we link mercury to Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, autism, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. We talked about the chemistry of mercury. How does it harm our body? It binds tightly to sulfhydryl groups in proteins, enzymes, nucleic acids, basically killing them. It causes free radical stress, wastes minerals, selenium and glutathione. We talked about amalgam fillings as a source of two-thirds of, of mercury in um, Americans. We talked about the position of the American Dental Association, a position I do not agree with. And then we presented studies linking amalgam mercury with childhood, adult, and fetal toxicity. We talked about the link between amalgams and brain function and mood, alcohol and drinking, oxygen binding and poor for metabolism. We talked about MS, mood hearing, and CSF protein levels, immune system activation, and kidney dysfunction. Tonight, we're talking about toxic rain. Seafood intake during pregnancy and childhood is a source of fetal mercury exposure. Mercury exposure from vaccines with a focus on autism. We'll talk about amalgams and oral cavity health, cardiovascular toxicity. Mercury produces oxidative stress. It wastes selenium, um, wastes glutathione. We'll talk about the interaction between cholesterol and mercury and the effect of mercury on atherosclerotic disease progression event rates. We'll talk about treatment getting rid of your mercury fillings, nutritional intervention, mercury chelation with DMPS and DMSA, and the use of a static magnetic field to help with mercury detoxification. Um, we'll start with toxic rain. This is data from the National Wildlife Federation report, September 1999. They looked at um, actual rain water mercury levels, compared that to the EPA safe level. And in the rain in Chicago has 42 times as much mercury as the EPA says is safe. In Duluth, it's 56. The best spot in the United States was four. The worst spot was Detroit, Michigan, 65. And this explains a lot. This does explain a lot. You know, I'm kind of a sports fan, and Detroit has four professional teams. And the Pistons, they're 3-0. and They're always good. The Red Wings are perennial winners. The Tigers have not, doing, have not done well, and the Lions, I mean, you know, the Lions, they're terrible. How come Detroit has two successful teams and two teams that are always losers? Well, the Lions and the Tigers, they practice outdoors. They're all getting mercury toxic. I finally figured it out. <laughs> you know, maybe, that, maybe there's something to that. You know, they're good in college. They come to Detroit, and they're no good, you know. One drop of mercury can, can close a 25-acre 25 25 lake to fishing. Coal power, uh, power plants emit 25 pounds a year. That's one-third of the mercury that enters the atmosphere. Two-thirds comes from municipal and medical waste incinerators. We burn coal, and the mercury is off-gassed into the atmosphere, comes down as acid rain into the groundwater. The fish pick it up. We eat the fish. So when we burn coal, we have a problem. And then when we incinerate medical wastes. Another thought, kind of an unpleasant thought, if you choose to be cremated when you pass on, you may be passing on more to your grandkids than memories of you if that mercury vapor goes up into the air. Um, blood mercury in American kids and in young American women. This is from the National Health and Nutrition Education Study 1999-2000 data. They looked at 700 kids aged 1 to 5, 1,700 women of childbearing age in the US. 
They did a household interview and asked them about fish and shellfish consumption over the preceding 30 days, and they did a blood mercury level, looked for correlations and interactions. The blood mercury level in the women was 1.02, three times greater than that of the kids. The blood mercury level in kids was greater in blacks than Hispanics than in whites. But the key was whether or not they had consumed seafood. Um, kids who had taken in fish or shellfish, their levels were twice as high as those of kids who would not. So a lot of the blood mercury is coming from seafood and shellfish. This is methylmercury. If we look at blood levels in women, greater in blacks than whites than in Hispanics, blood mercury levels were greater in older women, 1.19 in women age 30 through 49, 0.79 in younger women. The, the greater your degree of education, the greater was your blood mercury level. Presumably, if you're educated, you think that eating fish is a good idea, or you have the economic means to buy fish, you take in more fish, your mercury level is going to be higher. And again, the same situation in women with the kids. Those who had taken in fish um, or shellfish had greater mercury levels than women who had taken in neither. Women who had taken in fish and shellfish had the highest mercury levels of all. The, the, if you look at the number of fish meals or the number of shellfish meals over the past 30 days, you can see the more seafood you take in, the greater will be your blood mercury level. So putting this all together, our blood mercury level predominantly reflects methylmercury from seafood, rises with fish and shellfish intake, it rises with age because you, we don't know how to, de our bodies do not know how to detoxify, so the older you are, the more, it's like a cumulative problem. The more fish you've taken over your lifetime, the greater will be your blood mercury level. Rises with age, rises with education level because educated people tend to eat more fish than non-educated people. The National Research Council has a reference range of 5.8 as the upper limit of a safe level for a woman to have in her blood. And 8% of American women were above the cutoff. So if they're carrying a baby, that blood mercury is going right, right across the placenta. So 8% of American women, if they become pregnant, they're exposing their child to a dangerous level of mercury. And this is just methylmercury from seafood. It is ignoring the amalgam filling problem, which provides about two-thirds of American uh, mercury. So we have a real problem. Our babies are being born in a mercury-toxic environment. Seafood intake during pregnancy and, and the neurological outcome of the baby. 182 singleton births over a one-year period in the Faroe Islands they excluded premature births or kids with congenital neurologic abnormalities. This covered 64% of all live births in the Faroes. They looked at maternal diet, smoking, and alcohol intake, looked at maternal hair mercury as an index of fish methylmercury intake, umbilical cord blood mercury, what is in the, the mercury in the child circulation, and the neurologic status of the infant. The moms all had, took pretty good care of themselves. 68% were non-smokers. Only 10% had more than 10 cigarettes a day. Only 3% had alcohol, even once a month. 87% were abstinent. And they took in a lot of, um, of um, uh, fish and fish products, whale meat, whale blubber, and fish dinners. They looked at the neurologic optimality score. This, the neonatologist rates the kids, the integrity of the, the newborn's neurologic system. You would like a high NOS score. And there was no relationship between maternal hair mercury and the child's NOS, but the cord blood mercury was directly related to the NOS. Um, if the cord blood mercury was low, less than 10, the NOS was 51. As the cord blood mercury level rises, the, 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 um, the mercury level in the child circulation, the neurologic optimality score falls. And the cord blood mercury was related to the dietary habits of the mother, and, and the most important contributors were whale, then whale blubber, and fish. So I've told all of you to not eat any more whale blubber. Okay, no more whale blubber for you. Now, the apologists for um, fish mercury say, well, there's a lot of good stuff selenium, essential fatty acids, taurine, and indeed that's okay, but they looked at that and they found that the selenium and the essential fatty acids for the fish were not protective. So the mercury was toxic no matter what. Um, then, so, you know, our, our children are, are, um, are gestating in the uterine environment of women who are eating a lot of fish with mercury and they're breathing in mercury vapor and we showed 
two weeks ago how the, the number of fillings the mom has correlates with the amount of mercury in the internal organs of a child. And we know that amalgam filling mercury goes into breast milk as well. But if a child would be born without any mercury in their system, we're going to take care of that by giving them mercury in vaccines. Um, hepatitis B is a bad virus to have. It'll cause acute and chronic hepatitis. Um, it is blood-borne and sexually transmitted. Healthcare workers can get it with a needle stick. Otherwise, you would get it if you are um, uh, promiscuous with unprotected sex or if you are a drug addict sharing contaminated needles. You don't get it from casual contact. It has to be sexual or blood dirty needle transmission. Um, so we have decided to vaccinate all American babies for hepatitis B soon after birth. Now the immunity of the vaccine lasts about 10 to 15 years. Now, I've, I've got five kids. And so I've been in newborn nurseries a lot, you know, looking at my kids. And I'll tell you, I've never seen any of those babies engaging in unprotected sex or shooting up drugs. So there's no way these kids are going to get exposed to hepatitis B until they're adults, assuming they do become drug addicts. And the immunity of the, the, the vaccine isn't going to last until adulthood. So why are we doing this? Nobody can give me an answer. I can't think of a reason to do this other than to make money for the drug industry. But this is what we're doing. Um, and the antiseptic in the vaccine, in all the vaccines until recently, was thimerosal, which is an antibacterial preservative. And you get 12 micrograms of mercury in the form of thimerosal per standard pediatric dose. These, they, they, they make this stuff in multi-use vials. So diff, the nurses will be sticking the needle in and drawing some out. You have to keep that sterile. So they put in mercury as a preservative. Now, but in, in theory, that shouldn't cause any trouble because we adults do have mechanisms to neutralize and eliminate mercury. Metallothionine is a protein that stores copper and zinc. And fortunately, it'll also sequester, um, sequester mercury. Um, we can also eliminate mercury in the bile through the liver, or we can oxidize ethyl mercury to less toxic um, uh, uh, oxidized mercury. So here we have a study of 23 newborn infants. Five were full-term infants. They weighed uh, 3,500 grams or seven pounds. And there were 15 preemies that weighed only um, about two, two and a half uh, pounds, 1,000 grams. All the mothers were hepatitis B negative, so there's no reason to, to treat them. There's, they're not going to be exposed to hepatitis B, but they got the vaccines anyways. You measure blood mercury levels, then you give the vaccine during the first week of life, um, then you repeat the blood mercury level two to three days later. And what you find in blue is, um, here, first of all, the, the pre-vaccination mercury levels, these are the post-vaccination mercury levels. In the term kids, the mercury level rose 40-fold um, following the vaccine. So two to three days after the vaccine, your child's blood mercury level is going to rise 40-fold. In the preemies, their blood mercury level rose significantly as well from 0.5 to 7.4. Now, the upper limit of normal or the safe level is 5 to 20. That's the safe level for adults. Um, but these are newborns, especially premature newborns, whose nervous system is in the process of developing. All of us, our nervous systems are pretty much done developing, but our babies are forming up right now, and we blast them with mercury, and they are pre you know, they're little kids. Their metabolism, their defensive mechanisms have not been set up. They cannot oxidize mercury. They can't make bile. They lack a blood-brain barrier. They may or may not be making metallothionine, and this is organic mercury, ethyl mercury, and we're shooting it into our babies, right, you know, after they take their first breath, basically. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting, look at the pre-vaccination mercury levels. In the premature kids, it was um, about 15 times higher than in the term kids. Why would the blood mercury level pre-vaccine be higher in the premature kids than in the normal birth kids? My hypothesis is the reason these kids were premature is Mother Nature wanted to get them out of the toxic uterine environment.
They did not want these kids to develop brain damage from mercury from the mom, so Mother Nature stepped in and decided the kid ought to be born. That's a hypothesis on my part, but otherwise, why would the mercury levels be higher in the preemies than in the term kits? Now, thimerosal, which is the antiseptic in vaccines, is composed of thiosalicylic acid and ethyl mercury, which is just very similar to methyl mercury from fish mercury. Um, the FDA and the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics is assuring the public that vaccines are safe and that mercury is really not a problem and that people like me are nuts. And we have these kind old doctors saying, don't worry about vaccines. By the first grade, kids in the U.S. get 21 vaccines, nearly all of which up until recently contained thimerosal ethyl mercury. And here we can look at the different vaccine types, the brand names with mercury, without mercury. There's not that many without mercury. They're more expensive. If you get a, a pediatric vaccine without mercury, it has to come in a single-use vial, which is more expensive. And we want to save on costs, so we give them the multi-use vial with the mercury. And then we create autism, and each autistic kid is going to cost society about $4 million over their life. So we're scrimping at the wrong time. The flu vaccine that everyone's going to get has mercury in it. If you ask your doctor, does it have mercury in it, they'll say no. That's because they'll read the label. They don't know what thimerosal is. And it's really ethyl mercury. But most of us physicians do not, do not know that. Um, now, if you look at here, we're going to look at a brain homogenate from an animal that had received increasing doses of mercury chloride or a thimerosal, and we look at tubulin formation. And when there's no mercury, you make plenty of tubulin. As you give the animal more thimerosal, you don't make any tubulin. And we know that um, to make tubulin, you need to have proper enzyme function, and the mercury kills the enzyme, so you're not going to make tubulin, so your nervous system is not going to develop. Autism was first described in 1943 by Dr. Leo Kanner. Thimerosal was first used in vaccines in the early 30s. So when those kids were old enough to develop the signs and symptoms of autism, Kanner saw it. Now, the EPA has a safe level of mercury exposure. Now, I don't really think that there, there really is a safe level of a toxin, but they have, um, for regulatory purposes, the safe level, and it's 0.1 microgram per kilogram per day. That, by the way, is for adults. Now, if we give our baby the um, hepatitis B vaccine that they really don't need, they will get 12.5 micrograms of mercury divided by 3.6 kilograms, and then spread out over 30 days, it's only 0.1. So there's not a problem. The FDA allows the, the um, vaccine people to spread the mercury exposure out over 30 days. Now, after the, uh, the talk tonight, I'm going to go home and um, sit down and relax, turn on the Pistons game, I'm going to have a beer. And I'm going to be fine tomorrow. Tomorrow night, I might have a beer. Actually, you know, over the next 30 nights, I might have one beer, and I'll be fine. But if I went home tonight and I drank 30 beers, I would die, right? But for some reason, we're allowed to give the kids this blast of mercury and then spread it out over 30 days and say it's OK. What type of logic is, is involved here? None. This doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. Then, of course, you give the same dose to their premature kid, who is a lot smaller, and they get a much higher dose. This is bolus, not low-level daily exposure. This is mainlining it in. We're injecting it right into the kid. Um, it's thimerosal, which is ethyl mercury, which is more toxic than other forms of mercury. Thimerosal was never included in any EPA safety studies. And the EPA hasn't any jurisdiction here. The FDA does. No one has ever demonstrated thimerosal is safe. Eli Lilly makes it. Eli Lilly, which has been immunized against lawsuits by parents, this was snuck into the Patriot Act at the last minute, Eli Lilly did do some safety studies with thimerosal. What they did in the 40s when they were coming out with thimerosal, they injected it into people who were dying of meningococcemia. The meningococcus is a bacteria that can cause meningitis. It responds to antibiotics, but back then, it was before antibiotics, it was a fatal disease. 
So when you had a new drug, the practice was to inject it or to give it to people who were going to die anyways, or to death row inmates. And this was pretty much standard back then. And see what would happen, because you know if something goes wrong, they're going to die anyways. So they injected these people with thimerosal, and nothing happened for a couple days. And then they died. And that was the safety study. And then based on that safety study, we've been injecting it into our children. So it was never researched. They never looked. Not a once did they look. There's, now, the FDA has an advisory board on vaccine safety. In 1998, the FDA said, over-the-counter drug products containing thimerosal and other mercury forms are not generally recognized as safe and effective. So they took it out of my contact lens solution. The FDA and CDC, in a joint statement in 99, they requested, they requested, we asked politely, oh, vaccine manufacturers, can you please discontinue the use of thimerosal in vaccines? In 2000, though, they said vaccines have safe levels of mercury, which is kind of a stupid statement, really. Um, in the MMWR, the uh, Medical Weekly Report, M Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report from 99, there is a significant safety margin incorporated in all the acceptable mercury exposure limits. There are no data or evidence of any harm caused by the level of exposure that some children may have encountered in following the existing immunization schedule. Infants and children who have received thimerosal-containing vaccines do not need to be tested for mercury exposure. They never looked. They never made any calculations. This is all a big surprise to them. It was brought to their attention by parents. They never looked. Now, the FDA granted 800 waivers of conflict of interest rules to consultants. You know, if they have an outside advisory board, those people really shouldn't own stock in the companies that are being regulated, but they give out waivers all the time. 70% of the vaccine advisory board members own stock in vaccine manufacturers, own patents on vaccines, or receive money they were on the take from drug companies. Financial statements of the advisory board members were often incomplete. Congressman Dan Burton, who's really read the, who led the charge here, called this a violation of public trust. There's a book written on this by a man named David Kirby, and it's called Evidence of Harm, which is the entire story. And it's a very, very good book, but it's really going to upset you and make you sick when you see how our government really let us down and the health care officials who are looking out for our safety really let us down. And when it became obvious that mercury was a problem, they stonewalled and they looked the other way. And finally, finally, the mercury is being removed from vaccines. But the knowledge was out there. They had the knowledge a long time ago, and they hid it. And, and a lot of emails were leaked, and it's, it's clear that they knew it was a problem, but they didn't want to admit it because they would look bad. And so this is a very good book, but I warn you, it's very unsettling. It'll, it'll really make you uh, think and be a bit disappointed. Now, if we look, we are in the midst of an epidemic of autism. Back, it didn't really exist, or at least it wasn't recognized, before Canner discovers autism right after we started using um, mercury vaccines. And then as the number of vaccines that we gave our kids increased, especially the hepatitis B vaccine, which is totally unnecessary, the Vophilus influenza back vaccine, it's just skyrocketing now. Um, prevalence of autism per 1,000 kids, it was 0.5 before 1970, 2 per 1,000 in 96, now it's uh, 6 uh, per 1,000, and it's going to go up, and then now that the vaccine mercury is, issue is being addressed, it'll go down. It'll leave us eventually, but it'll take a while. Um, when you look at all the vaccines that your kids are supposed to get that you are pressured to give them, it really adds up to a lot of mercury. The EPA safe dose is 0.1 mics per kilogram per day. At six months, the kids have gotten 187 micrograms, um, and it averages out to 0.15. But again, they're getting it in boluses, not continuous, and it's ethyl mercury, and their poor little brains and physiologies can't handle it. So it's not an issue just with autism. That's the most obvious manifestation. But many of the behavioral and neurological and learning disability and attention problems of our kids today are due to the fact that they're being poisoned with mercury 
And of course, there's lead and cadmium and all this other stuff that we'll talk about next week. So our kids are being born with toxic minds, basically. They don't have a chance to develop normally. Ma you know, many do, but many don't have a chance. Um, but then why aren't all the kids autistic? Why only a few? Why not everybody? Well, again, we differ genetically, our constitution, our resistance to, disease, to different disease states. We have metallothionine. It will bind copper and zinc. It was given to us so we can hoard copper and zinc in case there's a famine. Mother Nature provides for us like that. It also, lucky for us, it'll bind up toxic metals. Um, it's also involved in the development of the brain and GI tract, and it has an antioxidant defense function. So it's a nice protein to have. Autistic kids have abnormal levels of nutritional metals. Their copper-zinc ratios are out of whack. And that was kind of a curious thing. So the researchers looked as to why. And at a meeting in, in 501, William Walsh and uh, Dr. Usman, they, they showed that 99%, or 4 to 9 out of 5 to 3 autistic kids, had a defective metallothionine system. They also have impaired methylation and transsulfuration. So the autistic kids genetically can't handle the mercury. It's not a quantitative problem. It is a qualitative problem. They can't handle any mercury because the defense systems that other kids have, they don't have. Now, so this is a genetic defect that didn't show itself 100 years ago because if you didn't have any metallothionine, so what? You're not, there's no mercury in the environment. There's plenty of copper and zinc. So this would be conserved in the gene pool because it was non-toxic. Now you have this genetic predisposition, and you throw in the mercury. These kids get zapped. So autism is an interaction between genetics and the presence of mercury. Stephanie Cave uses DMSA, a mercury binding agent, successfully to treat autistic kids. She's in Baton Rouge. She testified in front of, DAC, uh, of uh, Representative Burton's Committee on Government Reform. She has three, she's treated about 300 kids with autism, waiting list 150. And she thinks it's, it's all forms of mercury, vaccines, the Rogam injection that mothers get, flu shots, dietary fish, and amalgam. She points out that the behavior of animals who are mercury toxic is similar to that of autistic kids. And if you look at... Um, brain pathology of mercury toxic animals, it's very similar to that in autism and other neurodegenerative diseases linked to mercury. Um, you see elevated uh, tissue levels of mercury in autistic kids, uh, learning disabilities, ADHD and Asperger's syndrome. Kids respond to medical chelators and nutritional intervention. And she's turned a bunch of kids around and testified in front of Congress. Rashid Butar, found a way to make DMPS, previously an IV-only chelator, available in a transdermal form. And he used this to treat his child, who is flagrantly autistic. His kid is no longer autistic. His kid is a chess master. Um, Dr. Bonley, who I'm working with, has shown us that if we apply a static magnetic field to a toxic individual, this will enhance the efficacy of any chemical chelating agent that we use. And we'll talk a little bit about how we're putting Dr. Butar and Dr. Bonley's um, thoughts together. Um, so we'll switch away from, from autism for now and talk about amalgams and oral cavity health. A paper came out in 36, Lane and Coffrin looked at people with um, dissimilar metals in their mouth and looked at their symptoms. People had a metallic or a salty taste, increased salivation, burning or tingling sensation at the tip of the tongue, nerve shocks, you know, any of you that have fillings, you sometimes put a spoon in, you get this little buzz, um, general discomfort of the mouth. Dr. Pleva, a researcher in 83, was really sick. He's, no, none of the doctors could figure him out. Um, his physicians were stupefied. Now, I didn't say they were stupid. I said they were stupefied at Dr. Pleva's problems. Now, he had a bunch of mercury fillings, a gold bridge, a root canal with, with mercury and gold. This guy's a corrosion scientist. He looks at the interaction between different metals and the environment, and he's thinking about his health problems, and he's thinking about his mouth, and he's got different metals, and he has electrolytes in his saliva, so he figures, maybe I ought to get all this stuff out there because I'm obviously corroding. So he gets all his amalgams removed, and all but two of his 36 health symptoms resolved in three months, so he became a mercury researcher. Link, let's look at a study of amalgams and oral cavity health. 
101 young adults with or without amalgam fillings recruited through college um, and local newspaper ads. Young people with or without amalgam fillings. Look at the number of fillings, their hair mercury level, their urine mercury level, and their response to a dental health questionnaire. Hair mercury was 1.4 in those with amalgams, 1.1 in those without amalgams. Not a big difference, but urine mercury in parts per billion was three times greater in those with amalgams. Again, fish mercury goes to hair. Amalgam mercury comes out in the urine. And they looked at um, symptoms, and the, the kids with amalgams had the metallic taste in the mouth as opposed to those without amalgams bleeding gums, grinding teeth, foul breath. So they had a greater number of oral cavity symptoms. Well, so if you have these mercury fillings, you may have oral cavity symptoms. If we take out the fillings, are they going to get better? Questionnaire was sent out to 300 individuals who had had their amalgams removed. 86 responded, 26 men, 60 women, mean age of 40. 11 amalgams had been removed on average per person about a year earlier. And 54% um, overall the symptoms improved. They were eliminated in 32%. So the total improvement or elimination was 86%. So these oral cavity symptoms do improve when you get the source of the toxin removed. Um, why do I care about that as a cardiologist? It's because, and we'll talk about this next week, gum disease is a key cause of cardiovascular disease. These bacteria cause inflammation, they get in your blood, they get in your artery. So gum disease is a huge problem. If we evaluate your dental and periodontal health and then look at your health status 14 years later, we'll find that if you have pristine oral cavity health, you have a 10% death rate. But if 14 years earlier you have gingivitis, our most common infection, your death rate is 14%. If it's periodontitis, advanced gum disease, your death rate's 32%. If you have no teeth, reflecting disastrous oral cavity health, your death rate is 41%. If we look at new onset, cardiac, new onset cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular death, same situation. Your relative risk of developing cordy disease rises 5% over 14 years if you have gum disease, but if you have periodontitis or you, if you've lost your teeth, it rises by about 24%. Your relative risk of being dead 14 years from now, if you have gingivitis right now, is 23% greater than if you don't have gingivitis. And if you have periodontitis or if you lost your teeth, your chance of being dead rises by about 50%. So it's very important that we take care of the oral cavity. If not, those bacteria are going to take care of us. So then, let's, let's, let's think a little bit more about amalgams and cardiovascular symptoms. Mercury toxicity affects the EKG. In animal studies, you can make their EKG look funny by exposing the mercury. In the Iraqi disaster, which we'll talk about a little bit later, all of the mercury toxic individuals had ST depression. That's this EKG sign showing your heart muscles not getting enough blood and oxygen, and because it, it vasoconstricts the arteries. Um, Kawasaki disease, a pediatric illness which may be linked to mercury, they have abnormalities in their EKG, tachycardia, heart block. Mercury affects blood pressure. In animal studies, the blood pressure can be high or it can be low. Same in humans. If it poisons your pituitary and adrenal gland, your blood pressure will be low. You'll have postural hypotension. Over time, though, the free radical stress will cause vasoconstriction and you'll, you'll become hypertensive. Um, uh, in a factory um, in Russia where they were exposed to mercury, everybody became hypertensive after a period of time. They'd only let them work there for like five years. Then they have to get rid of them because they were getting sick. Um, amalgams and cardiovascular symptoms in young people. 101 subjects, um, healthy college kids. You look at the number of mercury fillings, hair and urine mercury. You look at their blood count, heart rate and blood pressure, and the results of a cardiovascular questionnaire. So you've got 50 subjects with mercury fillings, 51 without, equal number of men and women, um, same age, they're just kids, and the amalgam-bearing kids had 10 fillings, the others had none. Hair mercury is about the same. Remember, hair mercury reflects fish mercury, not amalgam mercury. Urine mercury reflects amalgam mercury better than fish mercury, and it's three times higher in young kids with mercury fillings. 
Systolic blood pressure was 106 in the college kids with mercury fillings. It was 100 in those without. The diastolic blood pressure was five points higher. The heart rate was lower. Now, a six-point difference in blood pressure doesn't seem like a big deal, but you think it's a good idea that the blood pressure in your college kid is six points higher, you know, when they're just 22 years old because they're already showing signs of mercury toxicity? I don't think that's cool at all. I think those kids are going to be good and sick when they're 50. And if you need it, you can nip it in the bud then. Their hemoglobins were lower. Their protein counts were lower. Subtle abnormalities because their enzyme systems are starting to be affected by the mercury. They're not overtly sick yet, but, you know, a poisoning is a poisoning, and it's just a matter of time before you become overtly sick. We showed last week how young, healthy people with mercury fillings are spilling twice as much protein in their urine as our age-matched people without fillings. Um, then they asked them about symptoms. Um, six of the kids um, who were, had amalgams were anemic versus three without. Fatigue was more of an issue. Tired easily was more of an issue. You can't make energy if you're mercury toxic. Tired in the morning, um, 10 of the non-amalgam kids and 25 of the amalgam kids. And I don't quite understand that because of my college age kids, 100% are tired in the morning. But, and they don't have mercury fillings. Chest pain, tachycardia palpitations were seen in the, in the kids with mercury. I will see young people with chest pain, postural hypotension, all these other symptoms, and most of them have a mouthful of amalgam. And I think these are the early manifestations of mercury toxicity. And if I get rid of the mercury toxicity, their symptoms often go away. They don't need drugs and pacemakers. They just need to be detoxified. Um, if we deal with mercury, will your symptoms go away? This is the study we, we uh, referred to earlier with oral cavity health. Questionnaires were sent to 300 individuals who had had their amalgams removed about a year earlier. And 83% um, of their, their cardiovascular symptoms did go away with mercury detoxification, as you would, as you would predict. Mercury, how is mercury affecting the heart? Well, it causes oxidative stress. It directly catalyzes free radical reactions, just like lead and iron. It binds to and inactivates selenium, a key antioxidant mineral. It weighs glutathione, blocks its regeneration, blocks the regeneration of E and C by glutathione, inactivates our mineral-based antioxidants, superoxide, dismutase, and catalase that we talked about in our very first lecture because antioxidant defense is so important to your health, and mercury just wipes out our antioxidant defenses. It increases production of superoxide free radicals in white cells. There's a concentration-dependent increase in the amount of peroxide found in your mitochondria where you're supposed to be making energy. It depolarizes the mitochondria membrane, and your LDL level oxidized LDL rises. Remember, cholesterol and LDL cannot harm us until it's oxidized. Mercury is a strong oxidant. So mercury will convert cholesterol into toxic oxidized cholesterol. Well, is this important or not? It's, it makes sense biochemically, but is it really going to be playing a role in atherosclerosis and the rate at which plaque progresses? Here we'll do a study looking at intima media thickness. Here you do an ultrasound of the carotid arteries, look at the sum of the, the uh, inner layer and the middle layer. Um, it reflects the extent of atherosclerosis in general, and the rate at which your intima media thickness, your IMT, progresses is predictive of who's going to get into trouble. So it's a good um, non-invasive measure of the extent of cardiovascular disease. The rate of change of the IMT predicts the rate of worsening of plaque elsewhere in your system. And it's low cost, uh, no risk, non-invasive exam. Study of uh, just over 1,000 healthy middle-aged Finnish men. At baseline, you look at their standard cardiovascular risk factors, the carotid artery IMT, and hair mercury, which reflects fish mercury, methyl mercury. Four years later, you repeat the carotid study, correlate the, the progression or lack of progression of the IMT with hair mercury and other risk factors. And they establish correlation coefficients. The higher the number, the more important that parameter is in predicting the rate of disease progression. The most important predictor at 0.12 is systolic blood pressure. Number two was your hair mercury, reflecting fish mercury. After that was if you took cholesterol-lowering drugs. 
it was not high cholesterol. It was if you took cholesterol-lowering drugs, which was predictive of disease progression, which is kind of interesting. Dietary iron, it's an antioxidant. Pack years of smoking and age. But number two on the list is hair mercury. If we look at the rate of carotid artery progression related to your quintile of hair mercury, those in the upper quintile, the upper 20%, they progress twice as rapidly as those with lower levels of mercury. Pretty significant relationship there. So we've got this paradox. You know, we've been saying that fish is good for the heart, and now I'm saying fish has mercury, which is bad for the heart. But there are studies showing that fish intake is protective, and I presented those studies to you, but those studies were conducted 30 to, 30 to, to 40 years ago before we polluted the fish stocks. And then fish was a good food. Now fish is a toxic food because of the mercury, which is a problem. So we have a paradox here. Let's examine it further. Dietary fish, you know, mercury-free dietary fish, is protective against coronary disease. We know that. The eastern fins enjoy a high fish intake, but they have the highest coronary mortality rate in the world. They're, the, they're low in selenium. They have high levels of, of lipid peroxides, oxidized LDL. Could mercury be the link? We're going to take just over 1,800 healthy middle-aged Finnish men, if there are healthy men in Finland, um, measure their standard risk factors, estimate daily fish intake, measure hair mercury levels, which looks at cumulative fish mercury intake, look at their oxidized LDL levels. Over the following five years, you're going to look at fatal and non-fatal heart attack, new onset coronary disease, cardiac and overall death rate, and look for relationships. Now, they took in, on average, 46 grams of fish a day, but there's a wide range between 0 and 620. If you divide them into their, their um, hair mercury levels into terciles, the relative risk of having a heart attack over five years, if you were in the upper tercile, the upper third, versus those in the lower third for hair mercury, you are twice as likely to have a heart attack. You are 2.3 times as likely to develop new onset cardiovascular disease. You are about three times as likely to die from cardiovascular disease, over two times as likely just to die in general. And if you stratify this in terms of fish intake, greater than 30 grams a day, which is the upper tercile, you can see your risks of heart attack, coronary disease, cardiovascular death were much greater. So those people eating a lot of fish accumulated a lot of mercury, and they had an increased cardiovascular event rate because mercury is a cardiovascular toxin. They found that the inland fish were the most mercury toxic because their, their inland waterways are polluted. Um, so those, the people that ate the inland fish got more mercury than people who ate the ocean fish. If we look at predictors of oxidized LDL, that's the bad stuff. Number one was hair mercury from fish. Number two was urine mercury from fillings. Then came nicotine, copper, iron. And the only thing that was protective is vitamin C. This is event-free survival high mercury in the hair, low mercury in the hair. You do a lot better with low mercury in the hair. So I think, again, there's something fishy here going on in the heart. Mercury, fish oils, and heart attack risk. This is a case control study. You looked at um, 684 men with the first heart attack, and as a control group, 724 men matched for location and age. And these were men without pre-existing known cardiovascular disease in eight European countries and in Israel. You look at the standard risk factors, multiple lab studies, you do a mercury level in toenail clippings, which is very similar to hair mercury. Um, it's fish mercury. And you look at adipose tissue DHA. You do a fat biopsy and look at the, the essential fatty acid content. That's also a marker of fish intake. We get most of our DHA from fish. Now, overall, the men who had had heart attacks their, their toenail mercury levels were 7% greater than those without heart attacks. Not really very impressive. There was a wide range. In Helsinki, the men who had heart attacks, their toenail mercury was 16% greater. In um, Edinburgh, it was even lower. In Malaga, it was 33% greater. But overall, the 
the toenail mercury, which is like hair mercury, was only 7% greater in those with heart attacks versus those without. So that would suggest that it's not a big deal. But if we, we, we look at this a little bit more closely, we'll see it is a big deal. If we divide all the subjects, the heart attack patients and the community controls, into quintile for hair mercury, going from the lower bracket to the highest bracket, 0.11 to 0.66, we can look at relationships with quintiles of DHA, selenium, alcohol, and hypertension. As your mercury content rises, you have more DHA, and that's because you're getting both from fish. So you know, to have a high mercury level, you had to eat a lot of fish, you get a lot of DHA. So there's some protection there from eating the fish. If we look at selenium, it also goes up because you get selenium from fish. However, in someone who's mercury toxic, even though you can measure the selenium, it's bound up to mercury and it doesn't have nutritional value. High blood pressure was greater, 17% in those in the upper quintile for mercury versus 10% in those that were lower. Why is that? Well, mercury causes free radical stress. Can't make nitric oxide, you're going to be hypertensive. Alcohol intake was greater in those with high mercury versus those with low mercury. Now, why is that? Are you more likely to drink when you eat fish versus when you have a steak? Uh-uh. But as we talked about two weeks ago, alcohol is one way of detoxifying yourself for mercury. So maybe these people who are mercury toxic, they chose to drink a lot more alcohol because their body found that it was a way of getting rid of the mercury. There's a lot of links here between mercury in the body and other risk factors and other behaviors. And if you then looked at the age-adjusted risk for a first heart attack as a function of mercury quintile, those in the upper 20% were 47% more likely. But the, the relationship is much stronger because you're, these people were mercury overloaded because they ate a lot of fish, they gave them protection. If you statistically negate the selenium and the essential fatty acid and all that and control for other risk factors, you can see those in the upper quintile for mercury were twice as likely to have a heart attack. So mercury is a huge problem. It's not obvious at first because fish give you a lot of good things that are protective, but if you dissect that out, it, you can see that mercury is a huge problem. Dietary intake of mercury contaminated to fish increases cardiovascular risk despite the protective effects of selenium, despite the protective effects of the EPA and DHA, despite the protective effects of the taurine in fish, mercury is a cause of atherosclerosis. Inland freshwater fish contain mercury. Fish intake greater than 30 grams a day is going to increase your um, hair mercury level by 50%. Your mercury burden increases your cardiovascular and overall death rate. Hair mercury is the best predictor of oxidized LDL levels. Mercury is a free radical stressor. It catalyzes free radical reactions like other heavy metals. It wastes antioxidants. It binds up your sulfhydryl groups, wipes out glutathione, your most important antioxidant detoxifier, ties up and inactivates selenium. Low selenium, of course, increases your risk of cardiovascular disease and malignancies. Looking at mercury and selenium, um, selenium will bind to mercury, and it can actually be used to detoxify mercury, but the selenium is wasted. Um, it's depleted by mercury, and we know that selenium levels are inversely related to the rate of carotid IMT progression, heart attack risk, the extent of your cardiovascular disease. Here, they looked at coronary, carotid, and lower extremity va vasculature and linked that with selenium level. If only if your arteries were normal, you have a high selenium level. As your selenium level falls, one, two, or more vessels. So selenium is protective against cardiovascular disease and cancer. We wipe it out with mercury. What do we get? We get cardiovascular disease and cancer. The Iraqi disaster. Um, there was a uh, drought in Iraq over several years, and there was a famine. And the Iraqis were uh, starving. So the Western countries came to their aid and sent over seed corn. And we were using seed grain, seed grain. And we were using um, mercury-coated seed grain because it's a fungicide. And of course, you want to make sure everyone knows that it's something you shouldn't eat, so it's colored pink. And they send it over in these big burlap bags, and it says, danger, do not eat mercury-treated. 
So we sent over this mercury-treated um, seed grain, but we didn't send it before planting season. We sent it during the eating season. And the warning that says this is mercury-coated grain, don't eat, was in Spanish. So they used it to make bread, ate the bread, and they got mercury toxic, and their kids really were damaged because it concentrates in breast milk and across the placenta. And they got good and sick with a lot of different symptoms, including cardiovascular symptoms, and their EKGs were abnormal, and they all showed ST depression. That's the EKG sign of not enough blood flow. You cause enough oxidative stress, you get vasoconstriction because mercury is a cardiovascular toxin. Here are some EKGs from the article. These are very bizarre EKGs. We see stuff like that in people like who are just about to die. And many of these people probably were just about to die from mercury toxicity. Um, I've shown you this slide before. If you do heart muscle biopsies in normal people and in people with pump dysfunction from idiopathic cardiomyopathy or decompensated valve disease or decompensated coronary disease, People with advanced coronary disease have five times as much mercury in their heart muscle as do normal people. People with idiopathic cause unknown cardiomyopathy have 22,000 times as much mercury in their heart cells. They have 12,000 times as much antimony, 250 times as much arsenic. The more antimony and mercury in their heart cells, the more complicated their arrhythmias, the worse the pump dysfunction. So I believe that these people weren't exposed to 22,000 times as much mercury as normal people. They can't handle the mercury. So dilated cardiomyopathy in adults is, I believe, due to an inherited or an acquired inability to handle mercury. I think cardiomyopathy in adults is, very, is autism of the heart. And I've presented to you in prior lectures individuals with cardiomyopathy who I would treat with um, chelating agents and a static magnetic field and fully resolve their cardiomyopathy because I'm getting out the toxins, Mother Nature is happy not to have the toxins, and the heart reverts to normal. I've done that a lot. Um, Cholesterol-lowering drugs and mortality. HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, the statin drugs, you go home tonight, turn on the TV, there's going to be all these competing ads from the drug companies telling you about the wonders of spending $100 a month for the statin drugs. They do lower blood cholesterol levels. They work by poisoning, or I'm sorry, blocking the enzymes in the liver that make cholesterol. They do have an antioxidant effect. They block the generation of free radicals. They do improve endothelial function. They do blunt disease progression by, on your angiogram and your CT scan. They do decrease event rates. They do save lives. So statins have a role dealing with the manifestations of other problems, but they do have a role, and in drug medicine, we're going to use statins. Now, um, the statins came out about 20 years ago. Mevacor was the first one. There are many other drugs that will lower your cholesterol, the other mechanisms. And here's a study that came out about 20 years ago of a non-statin cholesterol-lowering agent. And um, I was brand new in private practice, and a drug rep called me up and said, we want to fly you and your wife out to Los Angeles, put you in a nice hotel. We want you to go to this meeting because there's a big announcement. And I'm wondering, you know, why do they want me to go? I'm just out in practice. I don't have any patients. But they wanted to get me, you know, while I was young and impressionable. But they had this big study to release. And it was the first study showing that lowering cholesterol decreased cardiac mortality. And it was a randomized double-blind study in a major European uh, 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 city. And one group got the drug. The other group didn't get the drug. And in the drug group, the cholesterol levels fell. Cardiac event rate fell. Cardiac death rate fell, too. New England Journal of Medicine, it was on the news. Finally, we've shown that we can use drugs to lower cholesterol and decrease your cardiac death rate. And their stock went up. Then the paper came out, and I read it. And yes, the cholesterol level fell, the cardiac death rate fell, but the overall mortality rate was unchanged. Hmm. So if fewer people are dying of heart disease, but overall deaths are the same, that means that more people in the drug group are dying of non-cardiovascular problems. And they were. They were having more violent deaths and motor vehicle accidents and suicides. But the drug reps didn't talk about that. 
And I'm not going to give you the name of the drug in case any of you are taking it, you'll be upset. But this was the Helsinki study, and it was done in Finland. So we've got these poor mercury toxic fins, highest cardiovascular death rate, and then we go over there and we give them our drugs, <laughs> and now they're running off the road and committing suicide. <laughs> but the, 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 um, the, um, the stock of the American drug company went up, so it was okay. Let's, now, Japanese researchers reported in 1971 that your risk for cerebral hemorrhage, bleeding in your brain, was inversely related to cholesterol. That's just the opposite of what we were saying. But the study was confirmed in the United States. So people with low cholesterol were more likely to bleed in their brain than people with high cholesterol and have strokes. A study was done by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in 1992 they looked at 19 prospective cohort studies with a 9 to 30 year follow-up where we look at your cholesterol now and see where you are 10 to 30 years later looking for links between baseline cholesterol and your outcome. They looked at links between cholesterol and cardiovascular death rate, overall death rate, death related to non-cardiovascular disease. Early deaths were excluded. For example, um, if you have cancer and you're wasting away, your cholesterol is going to be low and you wouldn't really say that the cholesterol caused the cancer. So they excluded early deaths just looking at this long-term relationship. Their, their reference range, their normal range was a cholesterol between 160 and 199. And then they looked at relative risk versus the reference range if you were below 160, if you had a mild elevation, 200 to 239, or a severe elevation above 240. And what they found here, if we look at total mortality, the top two curves, um, one curve is the study group, the men, and another are men in the Mr. Fit study, the multi-risk factor intervention study, which is a large VA study of men looking at links like this. And you will see that total mortality was lowest between 160 and 199, and as your cholesterol level went up, your mortality increased. But what's also interesting is the mortality also increases with a low cholesterol. There's a bell-shaped curve in men. In women, however, there was no bell-shaped curve. Higher cholesterol was not associated with an increased mortality, only low cholesterol. So in women, low cholesterol is associated with increased mortality. In men, there's a bell-shaped curve. Let's examine that as to type of mortality. If we look at cardiovascular mortality, in men, the higher the cholesterol, the greater is your risk. If you have an exceptionally low cholesterol, your risk is less. In women, it's, it's, it's pretty much a flat line. With women, cardiovascular mortality is, is pretty much the same, irrespective of high, middle, or low cholesterol. Now, total mortality has this bell-shaped curve. When your cholesterol goes up, your risk increases especially with, with cardiovascular, but non-cardiovascular, we have the opposite relationship. Dying of respiratory disease, digestive tract, trauma, suicide. Individuals with high cholesterol are protected. People with low cholesterol are more likely. If we look at um, um, cancer mortality, high cholesterol is protective. Low cholesterol puts you at risk. Combine non-cardiovascular, non-cancer mortality, the same situation. So for cardiovascular disease, in men, a low cholesterol is what you want. It doesn't make a big difference in women. But for non-cardiovascular disease, a low cholesterol increases your risk. If we look at risk ratios for cardiovascular disease in men, if you're above 240, you're 86% more likely to die than if you are at the optimal range. But if we look at cancer death, if you're below 160, you're 23% more likely to die. If we look at non-cardiovascular, non-cancer death, low cholesterol is not what you want. All-cause death, there's a bell-shaped curve. But for non-cardiovascular, you don't want a low cholesterol. Why? Well, again, Mother Nature didn't give us cholesterol to kill us. It's there to be used. It has a purpose. And if we take it away, it can't fulfill its purpose. It's the raw material for the synthesis of all steroid hormones. It's an antioxidant. It'll soak up free radicals. 
structural support within cell membrane, especially the nervous system. Our brain's full of cholesterol. You call someone a fathead, you're giving them a physiologic compliment. We make coenzyme Q as, as a side product of when we make cholesterol. It's involved in the forward transport of fat-soluble vitamins, the reverse transport of fat-soluble toxins. One of cholesterol's jobs is to take good stuff to the cells and to take bad stuff like mercury and lead out of the body. Take that cholesterol away, it can't do its normal detoxification role. Cholesterol is not given to us by evolution or our maker for the express purpose of causing cardiovascular disease. Well, I'm suggesting that, that cholesterol plays a role in metal detoxification. I'm also going to suggest that many of you that have high cholesterol are mercury toxic, mercury lead and cadmium poisoning the enzymes that clear excess or um, unusable cholesterol out of your arteries. For your HDL to work, those enzymes, are, th those enzymes need phosphatidylcholine. They're poisoned by metals. So your cholesterol may be high, A, because Mother Nature wants you to have a high cholesterol to help get rid of the metals, and B, because the enzymes that clear extra cholesterol out of your body have been poisoned by the metals. So if we get rid of the mercury, what's going to happen to your cholesterol? If it falls, that would support my hypothesis. The core study, um, 24 subjects with mercury fillings, measure baseline cholesterol levels, replace the amalgams with biocompatible composites, repeat the cholesterol level, and the cholesterol levels fell. The higher your cholesterol level was beforehand, the more it fell. If your cholesterol level was low, not a whole lot happened. But if it was high, it fell. The reason it was high was because you were mercury overloaded. You get rid of the mercury, the cholesterol falls because your body's working the way Mother Nature intended. Lipoprotein A can also fall with mercury detoxification. I do this all the time. I'll have people with untreatable lipid problems. They can't tolerate the medicines. The reason they can't tolerate the medicines, by the way, is the enzymes in the liver that detoxify the drugs have also been wiped out. Their cholesterol is high, we can't treat it. We clear out the metals, and lo and behold, often their blood pressure falls, their cholesterol falls, because their problem was not drug deficiency. Their problem was heavy metal toxicity. How do we approach the patient with suspected mercury and or heavy metal toxicity? First, we have a high index of suspicion. The typical mercury overloaded patient has multiple symptoms referable to multiple organ systems that don't make any sense. You see doctor after doctor, specialist after specialist, no one can find anything the matter with you. Your blood counts look good, your CAT scans look good, but they're not looking for metal overload. Um, and at this point, you know, the doctors have said, well, you're depressed or you're crazy. And then you're so frustrated, you do become depressed. <laughs> and most of the people come in on antidepressants because they've sort of given up hope. Nobody will listen to me. That's one of the common complaints. No one will listen to me. They think I'm crazy. They think I'm making it up. It's just that you're mercury toxic and no one, wants to, no one looks. No one knows about it. So we have a high index of suspicion. Confirm the diagnosis as best we can, although it's difficult with the laboratory, and then we initiate treatment. How do we evaluate you for metal overload? This is very, very difficult. Hair analysis, look at hair and analyze it for the mercury content. It's not a very effective tool, at least in my hands. First of all, the, the amount of mercury in your hair is what your body can excrete. And many people cannot excrete mercury. If you look at um, first baby haircut hair levels in autistic kids, there's no mercury. Normal kids have more mercury in their hair than the autistic kids. The problem is the autistics can't get rid of the mercury, and many other people can't get rid of the mercury. That's why they're sick. It's called retention toxicity. So if you look at the hair, you're going to miss the boat completely. Um, it looks at organic fish mercury as opposed to amalgam um, uh, mercury. The problem of retention toxicity Hair can be contaminated, shampoos and this sort of thing, but it is inexpensive. It's available to non-physicians, so every couple of years the Journal of American Medical Association runs some biased study to trash hair analysis because the American Medical Association doesn't want chiropractors and naturopaths to steal any of our patients. So they're always trashing hair um, uh, mineral analysis, and they shouldn't. It has a role. It's just not very useful for me as a cardiologist.
So the hair analysis I don't use anymore. I do not find it helpful. Standard laboratory blood mercury level, urine mercury, really doesn't mean a whole lot. Your blood mercury level reflects your recent exposure. It doesn't reflect your total body mercury content. So if a doctor, if you say, doctor, I think I'm mercury overloaded, and they order a blood mercury level, that is not the doctor you want giving you advice because they, they're demonstrating that they don't know what they're doing. Um, urine mercury also will reflect more recent exposure um, than the cellular burden. So the standard laboratory is pretty much a waste of time and money, and I don't use it. A red cell mercury level. Now, the red cells are tissue cells. They live in the circulation for three months. They kind of give us a running average of what's been floating around. It does have some value. It's really best for looking at nutritional metals. Here's an individual. We see arsenic and lead, and we see low magnesium, potassium, and phosphorus. Heavy metals, one of the ways they harm us is kicking out nutritional metals. I like to do the red cell study to really look at what's going on in the nutritional compartment, which minerals I need to supplement. But it's not that great at looking at your totally bo total body burden. Um, here's an individual who you can see only lead in their red cells. It's, it's in the top 5%, but you don't see anything else. And here's the red cell study. Then I treated this patient with DMPS, a mercury chelator, and EDTA, a um, lead and cadmium chelator together for a diagnostic challenge. And you can see all this cadmium, lead, and mercury and nickel spilling out. So if I was making a diagnosis only on the red cell level, I would totally miss the boat. So the red cell study is good for nutritional metals, but not to really look at total body burden. Um, organ biopsy would be great, but of course it's not practical. Um, the best approach is the provoked urine mercury level. I will give you a defined dose of a chelator or a weight-based dose of a chelator and then I'll measure how much metal comes out in a six-hour urine sample. That is provocable metal spill, and that is accepted by all of us involved in metal detoxification as the best measure of your total body burden. It has some pitfalls. Some of you are so sick and your excretory routes are so gummed up that we can't get any metals out. But we have a high index of suspicion. We will treat you, and maybe a few months later, We'll repeat the test, we'll see more metal in your urine. You're not more metal toxic, you're just now healthy enough to get rid of the metal. In the autistics kids, you see very little at first. As they get healthy, you see more metal coming out. So the provocative study is the best measurement, but it still requires a lot of interpretation, experience, and judgment, and that's where my training and all that comes in. Um, so the approach is a high index of suspicion, confirm the diagnosis with lab testing, initiate treatment, we want to halt mercury exposure, nutritional support, mercury chelation with DMPS, DMSA, very limited role for EDTA, and a very important role for a static magnetic field. DMPS, which some of you refer to as dumps. That drives me crazy, by the way. It's 2,3-dimer-captoprofane-1-sulfonate, so we're going to call it DMPS. It is a diphyl chelator. You know, mercury binds to the SH, the thiol groups, and it doesn't want to let go. Well, this molecule gives you two thiol groups. Two is stronger than one. It'll pull the mercury off the thiol group of the protein in your cell and take it out of the body. And it's been used in the Soviet Union since 1958, and we didn't get our hands on it in the West until the end of the Cold War. Why? Because all the chelators were initially researched in uh, biowarfare as a defense. In World War I, um, uh, mustard gas, which is an arsenical, was utilized. And the British, wanted, between World War I and World War II, they were working on an antidote, and they came up with BAL, British anti-lewisite, a chelating agent to bind arsenic to be an antidote for um, chemical warfare. So the Soviet Union came up with DMPS, and they didn't want us to have, get our hands on it until we realized we weren't going to be going to war with one another. It can enter cells. It does not get into the nervous system. It's a diphyol chelator to remove mercury. And it's a very effective chelator. Here's a 64-year-old athletic man with a high cholesterol, 277, high homocysteine, no corneal disease, at least his calcium score was zero. His nutritional elements are okay. 
he has a mercury level in his red cell at the 99th percentile. He had a mouthful of amalgam fillings, ate a lot of fish. And we gave him a DMPS challenge, and he spilled a lot of mercury in his urine as we expected. And we gave him six IV DMPS treatments over six months and all the usual nutritionals. And the amount of mercury in his red cells fell. And isn't that interesting? His cholesterol fell from 277 to 235, the LDL from 186 to 121. We depoison him, his physiology works right, his cholesterol level falls. Move on to the next patient. Um, when we're using IV DMPS, which is our best mercury chelator, we give you three to five milligrams per kilogram IV over 10 minutes. Ideally, we'll give you IV minerals, vitamin C, and glutathione the next day, although that's rather pricey. It will remove not just mercury, but nutritional metals as well. So a mineral supplement divorced in time from the chelator is very important. We'll treat you typically every two to six weeks over a long period of time to get the mercury out. Again, we're peeling off the skins of an onion. We have to treat you. It took you decades to get sick. It's going to take us months to years to get you unsick, to slowly um, peel away the layers of the onions. And every now and then, we'll repeat the six-hour urine mercury level. And sometimes we see a gradual fall off in the amount of mercury you spill as we're detoxifying you. Sometimes we see a rise. As you get healthier, you can dump more metal out. Now, one thing, if we would treat you aggressively, say every two weeks for uh, uh, you know, six months, and then you're, there'll be very little mercury in your urine when we're done, and then we do nothing, and you come back six months later, and we repeat the challenge, a lot of mercury will come out. Because it takes, we're, we're peeling away the layers of the onion, we're getting at different body compartments, and we have to be patient and give time for mercury to diffuse from deeper layers to the more superficial layers. So it's a long, slow, boring process. You may feel worse before you get better. We kind of stir up things as with mercury is being pulled out. Some people feel kind of punk. It, it does not enter the nervous system. However, you can treat neurological disease on the basis of mercury quite effectively with DMPS. Um, I've treated autistic kids with great success using um, DMPS and a magnetic field. I presented those kids to you at the MME presentation. So even though DMPS doesn't get into the nervous system, because it lowers the mercury level throughout the body, it will then diffuse out of the nervous system into the rest of the body where we can scarf it up and grab it. And again, it's not a short-term project. You have to be patient. Here's a guy, multiple organ systems, health deterioration, healthy guy, a professional actor, just falls apart, sees doctor after doctor, he's not getting any better. His amalgams were removed, he got two IV DMPS treatments, and they did a hair mercury and it was low, and a non-provoked urine mercury and it was low. And they said, well, you're not mercury toxic anymore, which is terrible medical practice because there's never any mercury, you know, first of all, hair mercury reflects fish mercury, not amalgam mercury, and in an unprovoked urine, there's very little. So he got very bad medical advice, continued to worsen, multiple doctors, multiple therapies, he sees me, his blood pressure's low, his heart rate's low, his hormone levels are out of whack, he's fatigued, he has a pericardial effusion around his heart, and I do a red cell study, and the slide's not big enough, but his mercury level was way up here in the 99th percentile. So he was loaded with mercury, but the key is, you know, you, you have to look for it to find it. You're not going to see it in the hair. You won't see it in the blood. You won't see it in an unprovoked urine, but we did find it in, in him. Um, now, the IV DMPS is, is kind of is expensive. It's 100 bucks an IV. We only do it one to two times a month, and we give you a rest break. It's a pretty cumbersome program. Um, it's the best mercury chelator we've got, but it's expensive and difficult, and it doesn't lend itself to kits. Rashid Butar, whose son was autistic, needed a way of removing mercury from his kid, and his kid, kids don't want IV, so Rashid found a way to make a liposomal delivery system where little liposomes of phosphatidylcholine are used. They contain DMPS and glutathione in a 1 to 4 ratio, and glutathione is a great endogenous mercury detoxifier, and you rub it into your skin and it gets right into your blood, it's absorbed within 10 minutes, and this has really revolutionized mercury chelation. It's a lot easier, it's a lot cheaper, many more of you can get mercury chelation, 
and the standard dose is, it's in an adult, it's maybe 50 to 60 drops to your skin every other night. Um, and we want to keep you on mineral supplements. We divorce them from the DMPS. We have you take that at a different time of the day. I'm now utilizing a negative field sleep pad for many of my patients, and we'll discuss that in a moment. So what I'm doing is having you cut the DMPS dose in half and take it every night because I want the synergy between the negative magnetic field and the chemical chelator. Um, DMSA is another diphyol chelator, meso-2,3-dimer capto-succinic acid. It's a fairly weak chelator. It does not enter cells. It does enter the nervous system, and it does not enter saliva. Um, it is not my favorite agent. It is a very weak agent. I used it a lot before we had topical DMPS, and you can help people with it. Here's a woman, 55-year-old um, woman, with high blood pressure and postural hypotension. So her blood pressure, when she's lying down, is high. When she stands up, it falls. Her autonomic nervous system is out of whack. Cardiac arrhythmia, cholesterol 323, can't take any drugs. She has a cardiomyopathy, her ejection fraction is 40%. Mild coronary disease, 11 fillings, and I gave her DMSA, and her mercury spill was 6, which is high for DMSA. It's a weak chelator. She couldn't afford to get her fillings taken out, but I had to do something, so I treated her with with DMSA over a period of time, and she got better. Her PVCs went away, her hypotension went away, I stopped her answering the drug, her ejection fraction improved, her cholesterol level fell. And now she can tolerate cholesterol-lowering drugs. Because the reason she couldn't tolerate the drugs, all the enzymes in her liver that metabolized the drugs were poisoned. She couldn't tolerate the drugs for the same reason her cholesterol is high. We detoxify her, the cholesterol falls, and her whole physiology improves. So I would have loved to have gotten rid of the fillings, but we couldn't get rid of the fillings, so we used DMSA over time, and we still got the job done. Because it's not the mercury in the filling that's making you sick, it's the mercury in the tissues of your body that's making you sick. EDTA, ethylene diamine tetracetic acid, this is the classic agent used in IV chelation therapy. It will bind tightly to mercury, but it does not enter cells. If, when, we, when you have your fillings removed, you're going to get a big blast of mercury, one way to scarf it up is to immediately get an IV of EDTA. And that is EDTA's only role in mercury detoxification. Otherwise, EDTA is worthless, totally worthless as a mercury detoxifier. I don't care how many IV chelation therapies you've had with EDTA, it's not going to remove mercury from your body. Um, and in the MME presentation, I showed you a man with a cardiomyopathy who had 256 IV DTAs, and he was still mercury toxic. So EDTA does not remove mercury. Um, here's another man, athletic, non-hypertensive, 62-year-old, on a great nutritional program. He had received 90 IV EDTA treatments and a mildly abnormal carotid ultrasound improved. EDTA does a lot of wonderful things, and I love that molecule, and it's great for atherosclerosis, but it won't get mercury. Comes in to see me, he's in atrial fib, and he's got a cardiomyopathy. And I just look in his mouth, I know what I'm going to see. Mouthful of mercury. And I say, you're mercury tox. He goes, no, I can't be mercury tox. I had IV DTA. So to convince him, we do a red cell study. He's got plenty of mercury. DMPS challenge, he spills out a ton of mercury. So EDTA will not remove mercury. Key point. Um, SS, 58-year-old female with abrupt onset hypertension and arrhythmia. We see arsenic and mercury in her red cell. We give her EDTA, spilling a lot of cadmium, DMPS, spilling a lot of mercury. We treat her, and a lot of these problems are going away. Um, magnetic field chelation, which is something I'm really excited about, you know, and we, we gave a, a presentation on, on uh, static magnetic field therapy two weeks ago. Exposure to the Earth's magnetic field is necessary for life. Magnetic field deficiency compromises health. An augmented bipolar magnetic field, like most of the mattress pads out there, has mixed effects. The magnetic field is accelerating your electrons, so we want a unidirectional acceleration of electrons, so we prefer a uniform static magnetic field. An augmented static negative magnetic field with the mattress pad at your back stimulates our biochemistry. The energy charge within the cell is augmented. You make more ATP, you use more ATP, you can use that ATP to pump heavy metals out of your body. So chelation therapy will be brought on by a static magnetic field, 
but more importantly, it'll synergize with the chemical chelators that I've talked about. Many other health benefits. Now, with the bipolar magnetic, ma magnetic mattresses that came over from Japan 10 years ago, half the time your, your electrons are being accelerated, half the time they're being decelerated. That's not, not really productive. With the, stat, with the uniform field that we're talking about, the mattress pad is placed between the box springs and the mattress. You are exposed only to the negative, mag the properly oriented magnetic field. You're sleeping in a cloud of properly aligned magnetic energy, and that's how you get the health benefits. So I'm going to I'm going to state that sleeping on a uniform negative field magnetic mattress pad will promote metal detoxification, and maybe I should prove that. Here we take seven subjects, look at an eight-hour overnight urine toxic metal levels, while they're sleeping on the usual mattress, usual mattress plus the negative field magnetic pad, then magnetic pad plus 500 milligrams of DMSA metal chelator. And there's, um, there's the subjects, and we'll look at here. There's, at, on your regular magnetic mattress, you're not spilling much mercury. With the sleep pad, you're spilling a lot more mercury. Sleep pad plus the mercury chelator, a lot more is coming out, pretty much across the board. So the sleep pad works, the chelators work. Together, they synergize. We get more metals out of your body. Here's a 55-year-old man. Um, you don't see any mercury at first, but then with um, the, the DMSA you do, we also brought out arsenic and some aluminum. Um, patient E, a 41-year-old female who just had her amalgams removed, there's some mercury um, on the old mattress pad. With the magnetic mattress, it increases magnetic mattress pad plus the DMSA, a lot more comes out. Similar relationship with arsenic. No lead was coming out um, on her old mattress pad, but sleeping on the magnetic mattress pad, lead comes out, and there's a great synergy between the magnetic mattress pad and the chemical chelator DMSA. Um, so we prefer, if, whenever possible, I have people sleep on a magnetic mattress pad, a negative field uniform magnetic mattress pad, and take their chelator, either topical DMPS or oral DMSA at night to, to um, grab that synergy. Um, other studies, DMPS and mercury exposed workers, 10 men with occupational mercury exposure, they had a high urine mercury level, they had abstained from seafood for four weeks, you'll measure a 24 hour urine mercury level, treat them with oral DMPS, um, 100 milligrams three times a day for five days, repeat the urine mercury level, look at their routine chemistries. Urine mercury level is fairly low without any provocation. You treat them, they're spilling a lot more mercury when you're done. There's less uh, mercury in their urine. If you look, look at the numbers, very low spills at baseline, but when you're chelating, you're pulling a lot out. It's showing the chelators are grabbing mercury and taking it out through the urine. Um, mercury detoxification in New Zealand, 110 subjects undergoing a DMPS challenge. We give you a defined dose of DMPS. Look at how much comes out, or mercury comes out in the urine. 80 individuals with suspected mercury toxicity and amalgams, on average 15 amalgams per patient. 10 following amalgam removal and medical mercury detoxification, they've been treated. 10 dental personnel with or without fillings. 10 amalgam-free asymptomatic controls and you give them a, a standard dose of DMPS and look at what they did. They looked at the first 50 cc's of urine post DMPS. And they, the ones that chose to be treated went on a program of oral DMSA and vitamin C, lots of vitamin C, methionine, a good multivitamin program. Now, um, asymptomatic people, healthy controls without mercury fillings, here you can see their urine mercury levels are low and it does rise about 20-fold with DMPS, but it's still not a very high spill. Dental personnel who are exposed to mercury every day, they're spilling more mercury in their urine. With DMPS, their spill increases. Individuals who are sick with suspected mercury toxicity that had their amalgams in, they're spilling more mercury in their urine, 5.4 versus 1.8 in the healthy people, and post-DMPS, they're spilling a lot. They've got a, a high amount of provocable, provocable mercury. Um, then they took people who were treated, they get rid of the fillings, chelation, nutritional program, very little mercury in the urine, post-DMPS, not much more comes out. They had been successfully detoxified. 
those um, pre-detoxification, many had symptoms of memory, headache, cold feet, ringing in the ears, psychological problems, neurological problems. Post-detoxification, most of these symptoms went away, as you can see. Um, so the treatment for mercury overload, halt mercury exposure, we're going to get rid of your fillings, stop eating fish, just don't eat any more fish because it's full of mercury, and if you're working in a, in, if there's mercury in your workplace, you're going to get another job. Lots of nutritional support and mercury chelation. Don't eat fish. Freshwater fish are a disaster. Nobody should eat anything coming out of Lake Erie. It's all full of mercury. Don't eat it. You know, ocean fish, you know, swordfish, shark, um, the, the large predator fish, you know, it concentrates up the food chain. So the big fish, the tuna, the swordfish that we like to eat, they concentrate the mercury. If you go to the grocery store, you're taking your chances. They're not biopsying the fish to measure the mercury. So you're taking your chances. You can spend some extra money, go to certain websites like vitalchoice.com where they have low mercury fish that they fish in a certain way and they process in a certain way. You'll spend more money, but it's probably worth it. Um, now, um, chicken are, the, that we buy in the grocery store are often fed fish meal. So the chicken may have some mercury, and tree fruits coming from Central America, where they use mercury as a pesticide, is also somewhat of a problem. So you got to watch what you eat. Plenty of water, plenty of fiber, a lot of protein. You need some sulfur, complex carbs, essential fatty acids, all the usual stuff. Um, nutritional support is important. Mercury causes oxidative stress. It wipes out minerals. We're going to give you antioxidants. We're going to give you minerals. Um, selenium is a key mercury antidote, really. Study done in Estonia, 23 Estonians with relatively low serum selenium levels. You measure their pubic hair mercury and serum selenium levels. Why did they use pubic hair mercury and not head hair mercury? Everyone in Estonia is bald. No. Well, what the problem is, um, this was a, a country that, uh, that was taken over by the Soviet Union, and the economy was destroyed, and they're burning all this coal, uh, and they're not making any attempts to capture the mercury. So there's a lot of mercury floating around in the air. So they couldn't use hair mercury, because it would pick up mercury from the atmosphere. So they had to use pubic hair. Um, Except at a new beach, that wouldn't work. But there's probably no new beaches in Estonia. <laughs> Anyways, they do their baseline analysis, randomize them to receive 100 micrograms of selenomethionine a day or placebo, repeat the studies at four months, double-blind protocol, and with selenium supplementation, your selenium level rises and your hair mercury level falls. So selenium is sort of a biological <clears throat> antidote to mercury. If you can't afford chelation, just take a lot of selenium it will bind up the mercury and, and provide as a biological or physiologic antidote. Um, we got to get rid of your fillings eventually. This is the process of deamalgamation. And here's 12 subjects. What happens when you get your fillings taken out? 12 subjects, about 39 years old, no serious health problems, all with amalgam fillings, on average 18. You look at mercury levels in blood and urine, and then you horse out the mercury fillings. This was not done by a biologically oriented dentist. No rubber dam, no suction, no chelation, no nutritional support. They just horsed out the fillings, which is not what I would recommend. And what happens, your plasma or your blood mercury level rises, and then it falls later on. So your blood mercury level is going to rise. Many people who are sick and brittle, they've, go they've gone and had their fillings removed, without any medical therapy, no nutritional therapy, no metal detoxification, and they get sick. It tips them over. You should never have your fillings taken out without some form of protection because you're going to get blasted with mercury. Why would you want to do that? So what you do, what we used to do is you get your fillings taken out, come over to the office, we'd give you an IV of DMPS. Now what I have you do is rub the DMPS into your skin on your way to the dentist's or take your DMSA. That's the most important time to have a chelator in your blood. You're going to get a blast of mercury, no matter how careful the biological dentists in town are, 
you're going to get a blast of mercury vapor, so for heaven's sake, let's have a chelator in your blood. That just is so important to me, but most people don't do that. They just go to the dentist, have the amalgams taken out, and they think, and then they wonder why they don't feel so good. Um, anyways, over time, the amount of, urine, of uh, mercury in your urine will fall because the urine mercury is reflecting the mercury from your amalgams that's being off-gassed. So if you do take the mercury out, your ongoing exposure will fall. Your total body burden will not fall very well. The half-life of mercury in your brain is 20 years. So if you remove the source, that's a good idea, it's a good start, but you're not going to feel a lot better until we get the mercury out of your internal organs. Um, so how do we want to have your amalgams removed? By a qualified dentist. There's about a dozen dentists in Toledo who are biologically oriented. Some of them belong to the International Association of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, as I do. I've spoken at one of those meetings, and there's a protocol for the safe removal of amalgam fillings. Um, we will give you some sort of chelator before or right after. They'll have you uh, swish and spit chlorella or activated charcoal, all kinds of strategies to get the mercury out of your mouth without allowing any of it to get into your body. Um, then, will this comprehensive program work? Uh, Dr. Robert Kidd treated 42 mercury uh, toxic patients and wrote it up. They had chronic musculoskeletal pain, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, chemical and food sensitivities. Their enzyme systems were all in disarray. MS and ill-defined neurologic diseases. He treated 60 patients between 94 and 99, and then he sent him a questionnaire, how do you feel now, and 70% responded. Um, he had a, a, his own program way back then is a little bit different from my program because I have better molecules to work with. He had to focus on more aggressive nutrition. He would use chlorella, which is a mercury binder, vitamin C, garlic, antioxidants. Um, the amalgams were removed in the proper uh, fashion. They received vitamin C afterwards. And he used neural therapy. There you can inject DMPS into certain nerve ganglia, and you'll get that seems to assist the body in getting rid of mercury. That's not something I know how to do. Nutritional supplements, cilantro, which is an herb that's a mercury chelator. Every four weeks, they get IV DMPS. That was his big gun therapy. He'd continue that until their symptoms got better or there was very little mercury in the urine after DMPS. His patients had fatigue, poor memory, headache, muscle aches, food and chemical sensitivities, depression. Um, then he asked them to rate the change in their status, and the farther you go to the right here is the better response, um, but their fatigue, most of their symptoms went away when they were detoxified properly. Um, level of patient satisfaction, 47% were very satisfied, a total of 77% were happy that they had that done, and of course we do want satisfied patients in the long run. We want to be satisfied and we want you to be satisfied. Um, when we talk about mercury, it's a controversial issue, and the controversy really is what's the best way to detoxify someone? And my colleagues and I argue and debate, and my approach changes every three months. I'm going to go to a meeting this weekend, I'm going to give a talk, I'm going to listen to some other guys talk, I'm going to come back with a better way of dealing with mercury. And it's okay for us to argue opinions, positions, hypotheses, interpretations, that makes us better healthcare providers. Of course, it's a total waste of time to argue facts and science. We're not going to waste time arguing about whether eating fish is good or bad. We're not going to argue whether vaccines are okay or not. We know they're not okay. They know they're not okay. Everybody knows that the, the, the mercury in vaccines is a terrible idea. That's why they're finally removing it. We won't waste time arguing facts. That's a waste of time. We don't have a lot of time because we're very busy trying to detoxify people, which is really the only way our, uh, our society is going to remain healthy. We're a very, very sick, toxic society. We are sick. Our kids are even sicker. They may or may not show it yet. If we do not detoxify ourselves, we really don't have much hope for a happy and healthy life. So we want to do a good job with detoxification. We presented mercury as a neurotoxin. We presented how mercury gums up the enzymes that makes uh, tubulin and microtubules and axons. We link mercury with neurodegenerative diseases of childhood and of old age. We talked about how does mercury harm us, binds to sulfhydryl groups, causes free radical stress, waste selenium and glutathione, waste minerals. The American Dental Association, their position is that mercury fillings are safe 
and that the mercury is inert and it won't harm us. And if we presented science refuting their position, their position is ridiculous and they all know it, but they can't move from that position. They're afraid of lawsuits. Tonight we talked about toxic rain. Whenever we burn mercury, it to, when we burn coal, or we, when we incinerate ourselves, some of that mercury goes in the atmosphere, it gets into the groundwater, it's taken up by the fish, we eat the fish, and it enters our body. Seafood intake of um, mercury is a major problem because um, maternal seafood mercury intake is fetal mercury intake. We talked about the presence of mercury in vaccines is entirely inappropriate. Vaccine mercury is the key cause of autism. Amalgams are associated with impaired oral cavity health, and if you have poor oral cavity health, that predicts an increased cardiovascular uh, death rate, and an overall death rate is increased. We showed how mercury is a cardiovascular toxin causing oxidative stress, selenium depletion. We showed the effect on the interaction between mercury and cholesterol. I think that many of you with high cholesterol are metal toxic. That's the key problem. Uh, the more mercury in your body, the, the greater is your risk of a cardiovascular uh, event. The greater is the rate at which your cardiovascular disease, the carotid artery IMT, will progress. We talked about treatment, getting rid of the mercury, nutritional intervention, and mercury chelation. For more information, there's a couple really good websites. Dr. Boyd Haley is the chairman of biochemistry at the University of Kentucky. He's the world's authority on the health biochemistry of mercury. He has a website, altcorp.com, A-L-T-C-O-R-P, and he talks about vaccine mercury and amalgam mercury in scientific terms. Um, bioprobe.com is sort of the online newsletter of IAOMT, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. Their website is www.iomt.org. Uh, the American College for Advanced Medicine, I'm going, to be at their, I'm going to be speaking at their meeting this weekend, or the ISOM, the International College of Integrative Medicine, I was speaking at that meeting a, a few months ago, are physicians who are interested in heavy metal detoxification. We hope over time more and more physicians become interested in heavy metal, metal detoxification because I think that's the pathway to uh, maintaining good health. That's all I have to say about mercury. Thank you very much for your attention.